this is a photograph of my mother. My mother was very bright. If she'd only had half my opportunities, she would, I'm sure, have excelled anything I've achieved. I owe my advocacy skills to my dad, because when I was a little girl, my dad was uh, enormously supportive of me and was always playing games with me. And one of our favourite games was to make me talk about a subject for a minute with a clock watch. He, without, I'm sure, realising it, was making me have lateral thinking and just enabled me to engage in dialogue. Not that it took much. I was always a talker. <laughs> My parents came from an age where they would not get into debt. They absolutely categorically refused to get into debt. And so they saved until they could afford their own house. By then, I was 21 and they were in their late 50s, but they did buy their own house. But between the ages of five and 21, we lived in this council flat where the environment outside was very scary, um, lots of crime. I grew up with um, coming home one evening with um, some friends and their parents to find ambulances and police cars outside because my father had been stabbed in the chest. There were many examples like that. The worst example was when I was 11. My parents had literally popped up the road about half a mile. They had caught two um, teenagers breaking into my father's vehicle. Um, my father asked them to give him the keys and then he'd let them go. With that, one of them hit my mother. Within about 10 minutes, there were about 20 to 30 youths outside. They were rocking my father's car. They had broken bottles, they had chains, they had knives and everybody in the locality called the police. They were eventually caught that night and stood trial and they were convicted. On the day my parents went to the court for the trial, the uh, detective inspector met them on the steps because the father of one of the main uh, defendants had arrived at court with a gun to shoot my parents. My parents were probably one of the very few parents that were ever called in to the school regularly to be told that I ought not to be working so hard. I was getting involved with my mother's firm where she was a secretary and then went on to be a legal executive. I was asked to accompany a man to the Old Bailey for his trial. I think I was about 14. What I didn't realise was that it was actually Charlie Cray. <laughs> when I went home that evening, uh, my father asked if I'd had a good day and I can remember saying, yes, I've had a, a lovely day and I'd taken this man to the Old Bailey and he actually said, what was his name? and uh, I struggled to remember it and said, I think his name was Charlie Gray. And my father realised and uh, was pretty concerned that perhaps that wasn't the best of um, jobs I should have been given. Yeah, at the age of 18, I'd had um, a bit of a health problem. I'd had to go into hospital, have an operation. And at that time, I had been working in a further education college. They had a course, which was a legal executive course, coming from the background that I did. I think I really believed that that was as far as I would go. The moment I sat in that very first lecture was the day I realised this is where I want to be. And ended up in the office of a friend of mine who was going to law school the following Monday. Now in those days, you had to apply three years in advance to go to law school. Her boss, who I'd never met before, came into the room and he said, well, have you rung law school to see if you could go on Monday? And I just shrugged my shoulders and said, well, it's out of the question. And I promise you, this is what happened. He rang. He just about managed to get my name written down properly to say he had this young lady here who um, would like to go to law school. What was the chances of her joining on Monday? And as he was talking, she then said, you'll never believe this. We've been handed a cancellation. If she wants to go, she starts on Monday. And that's how I went to law school. I then went to um, a practice called J.B. Wheatley & Co. for, I think it was almost 10 years. And I'd been very um, fortunate enough to become a, a partner within a, about a year of qualifying. I'd met my husband. He suggested to me, is this something that you've ever thought about doing yourself? And I think it sort of made me think, well, perhaps I could have my own practice. I opened in Camberwell, on Camberwell Green and I was surrounded by solicitors' practices, all of which were owned by men. 
there would be constant rumour and gossip that I was awful to work for. And there would be equally um, suggestions to clients that they didn't want to come to me because I wasn't going to be able to deal with this, that or the other. I was aware of what was going on, but I saw it as fierce competition. Again, at my age, looking back, it was probably worse than that, and it was discrimination. It was something that was suggested to me by um, a very senior judge, and that took me very much by surprise because there wasn't another woman solicitor QC, and at that time there were only, I think, um, nine male solicitor QCs. I thought, do you know what? I will apply. I've got nothing to lose. I realised someone had given me an opportunity and I wanted to make the most of it. I hadn't realised when I received the notification that it was going to be um, such a historical event, if you like. I began to realise that actually this was the first time um, a woman's solicitor had become a silk. I've always believed in, and I will believe in until the day I die, that justice should be available across the board for all members of society. Legal aid should be there according to need, in my opinion. And that's where I think the governments, over the years and since it was first introduced, the end of the 1940s and the welfare state, I think that's where they made mistakes. And instead of correcting those mistakes, they've just now whipped the carpet away. I'm seeing children suffer, I'm seeing adults suffer, and I'm seeing the rule of law suffer. A few years ago, I happened to have a case where the mother I was representing in the case was also the patient of my GP. It sort of enabled us to actually look at what we both do, and he's as committed in his field as I am in mine. It was at the time when legal aid was being reduced and reduced and reduced, and so I decided that perhaps I would offer a pro bono walk-in clinic. I wanted to offer something to people that um, simply aren't eligible for legal aid. The thing I always say to youngsters when um, I talk to them coming into the profession, always remember, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. Second, I think you have to have a passion. You have to enjoy expressing yourself verbally, because what we always say again when we train advocates is have a conversation with the judge. You're not lecturing the judge, you're not um, shouting at the judge, you're actually trying to engage the judge in dialogue. The art of persuasion is the approach that you adopt. And although there is a time and a place for um, an aggressive approach at times, I try to live my life with the policy of there's more bees with honey than vinegar.